I am at Overmark to teach lower sec math, upper sec E math, and A math. Okay, so currently I have a sec one math class and a sec two math class and four upper secondary class. So I'm an experienced tutor with four to five years of teaching experience, and I have helped numerous students score well in the end of their examinations with about more than 70% achieving distinctions in their major exams, be it for end of year or for O level. Okay. And one fun fact about myself is that I was one Singapore's number 17 carry in Mobile Legends. So I don't know how many of you here still play Mobile Legends, but if you do, then yes, uh, maybe one day we can play together. Okay. Moving on to our center. Okay, so we have about seven branches across Singapore. We are currently at the Coven branch, and we have a few other branches at Tampines, Jurong East, Bukit Timah, Marine Parade, Woodlands, and Topayu. Okay, so over here at Overmark, we provide a lot of cheat sheets, notes, uh, worksheets, tests, mock papers for our students to use and to revise for the end of your exams. Okay. Okay, so with that, we will get lesson started. So for today, we are going to be covering the three topics percentage, number patterns, and polygons. And afterwards, I'll be going through the mock paper that some of you would have done uh, if you collected last week. Okay. In between, there'll be a short card quiz for you all to recap on whatever that was taught. And there will be a reward for the top context for the person that won. That we, okay, but there's only one reward. Uh, so only one person can win. Okay. So that will be after I go through the lesson notes for today. Okay, so let's get started now for our notes. So first part, we are talking about percentage. Right, and for percentage, <clears throat> it is a topic that you have briefly learned in Prem six. Right now, got it in right now. one. You have to consider a few. Hmm? Why they got notes? Ours is just uh, mock paper. The lesson notes are there. Okay. For those online, if any of you don't have the materials or you can't see the link in the chat, let me know. I'll send the link. Okay. okay, so as I was saying, so over here in percentage, right? Percentage is another way of expressing a number as a fraction out of 100. So percentage will always have a denominator that is out of 100. So let's say we are talking about 20%. It will be 20 over 100. Okay, so this is just an example. Hello, set one math, right? Okay, have you collected the mock papers? Can you take a copy of the lesson notes over there and the mock paper over here? Mm -hmm. Okay, and also, so you can convert from a fraction or a decimal into a percentage by multiplying by 100. So right now, let's say I have a fraction like 2 over 5. You want to convert this particular fraction into a percentage, you will multiply by 100, okay, which will give you 40%. So take note over here, when you multiply, you do not multiply by 100%. Because if you think about it and you keep in the calculator, 2 over 5 times 100% will just give me back 2 over 5. Why? Because like I said, percentage means you are writing a number as a fraction. When I'm writing 100%, Essentially, what does that mean? It means 100 over 100. And what is 100 over 100 equals to? Anybody? 1. Right? So you're essentially just taking 2 over 5 times 1. And that will not give you your percentage. Okay? Hello. Can you collect your lesson notes in front over there? And if... Do you have the mock paper? Okay, then this is the mock paper. Okay. Okay, so this portion is the first thing that you must take note of when it comes to percentage. You multiply by 100, not 100%. Oh, I cannot. Okay. Then afterwards, if you have a percentage, you want to convert back into a fraction or decimal. Okay. So this is what we talked about just now, right? If you are writing a percentage as a fraction of 100, from here, you just need to put whichever number here into the numerator and out of 100. But always remember, when you present your final answer in the exam, you must always simplify your fraction. So always simplify your fraction into the simplest form.
Okay. And something new that you learn in set one now is this thing called percentage change, right? Be it uh, increase or a uh, decrease. So it can be a decrease or increase. But regardless which one are you looking out for, whether it's increase or decrease, your formula remains the same. It will always be the new value minus your O value over your O value. So denominator will always be O value, no matter what. Okay. And if you think about it, when we, when we talk about increase, okay, if there's an increase, so let's say this is my O value, this is my new value. If now I am going from 50, $50, okay, let's say you are going for $50 to $60. You are increasing, right? And what is this particular increasing over here? Uh, hi, do you have the mock papers? Mock papers. Have, okay, then can you collect the lesson notes in front? Okay, so let's say we are starting at $50 and we are increasing to $60. The question here, if you are asked to find what is my percentage change, okay, the triangle symbol means change in math, okay? So percentage change, you always take your new minus your O divided by your multiplied by 100, which will give me 20%. Okay, so in this case, you can see my percentage when I calculate, this is positive. Right, this is positive, which means there is an increase. When your percentage change is positive, it means there is an increase. So now having said that, if my percentage change is negative, if right now this is negative, do you think it's an increase or a decrease? Who thinks it's a decrease? Raise your hand. Decrease, huh? if it's negative, and if you think it's a percentage decrease, raise your hand. Nobody raise your hand means everybody thinks it's increase. Huh? I think I'm in the wrong class. I don't have that. Okay, wait, uh, let me just... Okay, for those online, your materials are in the group chat. Let me send the link again. Okay. So I say again, when you have an increase, your percentage increase, your percentage change will be a positive value over here. So if it's decreased, it will be a negative value. Okay, so this portion you must bear in mind. <clears throat> so this is when they are asking you for percentage change. If the question asks you for percentage decrease, they already take into account the negative portion. So let's say you calculated your percentage change to be negative 10%, right, according to my formula. If your question asks you for percentage decrease, when you present it, just to write down 10%, you can ignore the negative sign because the negative sign is taken, uh, taking into account this decrease rate. So your presentation here is very important and sometimes if you were to write the negative sign, you will not be given a mark, okay? If your teacher is very strict with the marking. Okay, and a few other things in percentage are your GST and your service charge, we will, which we will talk about in our work example number four, five, okay? So for now, let's take a look at first example. So Paul bought a total of 60 fruits for making fruit tarts and out of order, I think no, this is not fans, this is fruits. Okay, out of all the fruits bought, so features, 19 were pears and the remaining were apples. So what percentage of the fruits were apples? So first thing first, before you want to find the percentage of the fruits which are apples, you must understand if you want to find the percentage, in your numerator, it will be your apples. Because apples is a subject, you only care about the apples. And in your denominator will be my total fruits. Multiplied by a hundred. Okay. So usually your denominator is what comes after the percentage in your question. So like, for example, what percentage of this class is boys? What percentage of this class wears specs? My denominator will always be the number of students I have in this class. Numerator will always be whatever you are looking for. So in this case, it's my apples. Okay. So first thing first, we must find for me how many apples do I have. I have a total of 60 fruits, 8 are peaches, 19 are pears, and the remaining are apples. So to find out how many apples I have, it will be 60 minus 8 minus 19. Okay. Over 60 because I have a total of 60 fruits. Multiply by 100. 
take note is by multiply by 100. Okay, so from here, key this in the calculator and you will see 55%. One more thing about percentage when it comes to a question like this, okay, you have to be, you have to take note. Uh, all of these 60 foods, how are we distributing them? We are distributing into peaches, pears, and apples. All these three different foods makes up my total number of foods. And my total number of foods will always be my 100%. So if my apples is 55%, my peaches plus pear have to make up to 45%. Okay, because my total has to be 100%. Okay, so another way you can calculate this is you can always go and calculate for me what percentages are pears and peaches, right? Which means it will be 8 plus 19 over 60 multiplied by 100. You should see 45%. Okay, so if you were to do this method, you calculated how many percentages are peach and pears. You have to find out answer. Take 100 minus 45 to get your final percentage of 55%. Okay, so this is another method you can consider. Either way, you will get the final answer. Okay, but you must take note, uh, these three fruits adds up to 100%. So if somehow your numbers don't add up to 100%, means you must have made a careless mistake or a calculation error. Okay. Okay, moving on to work example number two. At any point, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or you can always ask me after the class or during the break later. Okay. So moving on, Jason had $275 left after he bought a new toy, which cost 60% of his money. He then spent 20% of his remaining money on new clothes. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with a question like this, right? Because this is considered one of the tricky questions in PSLE, right? Right now, to solve a question like this, okay? Now you have two phases. You started with a sum of money, you spend it on a toy, and then you are left with your remaining money, which you then spend on new clothes. So for this, there are two phases. How you should effectively do this and make sure that you don't make any mistakes is very simple. Instead of starting with 100%, you start with 100 parts, okay? And out of these 100 parts, the toy is 60%. So when you start with 100 parts, it makes your life very easy because if original is 100% and that's 100 parts, 60% will just be 60 parts. And these 60 parts went to toys. So if I started with 100 parts, I spent 60 parts, I am left with... 40 parts, and this will be my remainder. Okay, and from here, my remainder has a total of $225. Right, so from here, the question also said, he then spent 20% of the remaining money Right, so this question is very straightforward because you are given how much money you are left, which means you can easily find out for me my percentage or rather my money spent on my new clothes. But in the event you are not given this amount, this is where this bunching method will be very useful because you are, so, you are spending 20% of my remaining money, which is 40 parts. So on your new clothes, what you are spending is not 20 parts, uh, it is 20% of 40 parts. So it will be 20 over 100 times 40 parts, which will be 8 parts. So 8 parts will go to your new clothing, which means you are essentially left with 32 parts. Okay, so this bunching method allows you to find out for me how many parts is left, how many parts uh, do you spend, so and so forth. So from here, you can work it backwards to solve for how much you have at first or how much you have spent on your toys. Okay, so this question, part A asked me how much money did he have at first. So if 27, I mean, sorry, if $275 is my 40 parts, you started with 100 parts. So what you do know is that 40 parts is equal to $275.
And now you are looking for how much money I have at first, which is 100 bucks. Okay, so this is something that you are very familiar with already. In primary school, what you will do is you will find out what's one part, then you find out what's 100 parts. Okay, but now you are in secondary school. So if you want to do this in one line, okay, it will be very simple. It will be 100, which is whatever you are looking for now, over whatever you had, which is 40 parts. Multiplied by my amount of money. Okay, and from here, what you see in the calculator will be $687.50. Okay, so this question, we are working with money. Money, if you want to present your answer, you must always present in two decimal places. Okay, so this portion, you have to be very careful on your presentation. Okay, so afterwards in part B, the question said, how much money is he left with now? According to my bunching method, I am left with 32 parts. Right? I'm left with 32 parts. And from the question, you have already found out that you started with $687.50, which is 100 parts. So if we are working with how much we are left, that will be 32 parts. So using the same working that I introduced to you just now, this portion over here, numerator will always be what I'm looking for, which in this case is 32. Denominator will always be what I have, which is 100. Multiplied by how much money this 100 parts represents, which is $687.50. So from here, what you will get is 200 and Okay, moving on to my next board example. Okay, so this board example, your solution is already provided for you, but there's no explanation. Okay, so let me explain to you why are the workings like that for part A, part B, and part C. Okay, for part A, the question asks for the percentage of boys in the lecture theatres. So first thing first, you, we all know by now, if you are looking for the percentage, my numerator must be whatever I'm looking for which in this case, it's my boys. Denominator will always be my total, which is my students. So multiplied by 100, which is why my first line here, I found out for me how many boys I have. Okay. And for part B, sorry, can you change? This will be percentage of boys, not percentage change. It will just be percentage of boys in the lecture theater. So now what happened is that nine girls left the lecture theater. So if only girls leave, means the number of boys I have remain the same. So which is why, if you notice, my number of boys, which is in my numerator, remains the same. because no boys left or no boys came in. So my numbers will remain the same. But if I have girls leaving the lecture theater, it means that my total students will decrease. Okay, which is why this portion over here is different from part A. Okay, because total decreases. Okay, so this is for part A and for, for part B, which I think is quite straightforward. For part C, the question said, it is given that K more girls are need, need to leave the lecture theater such that the number of boys is at least double the number of girls. So we kept what I said just now. Your total percentage, when you add it up, it will always be equal to 100%. So your total students will always be 100%. And you are splitting up into boys and girls. And according to the question, they want it to be at least twice, at least double the number of girls, which means boys must be two parts, girls must be one part. So if you actually go and calculate, in this case, how are we spreading out the percentages? Girls will be 33 whole and one third percent. 
right? Because it's 10 divided by 3. So if this is two part, this is one part, my 100% must be three parts. And that means for my boys, it has to be 66 and two third percent. So you need the boys to be at least this percentage, right? And take note, this question wants the girls to be leaving. So my number of boys remains the same at 44, which is why if you notice my numerator here, is still 44 because I had 44 boys at first. I am not changing it. So my boys remain the same as usual. But now, same as previous part, if I have girls leaving the lecture theater, it means that my total number of students will not be the same anymore. I had 86. After K more girls leave, I will be left with 86 minus K. So this will be after K number of girls leave. So this calculation, this fraction here gives me my percentage of boys which we have found out to be 66 and two third percent. Okay, which is essentially the same as the decimal over there. So from here, you have a fraction equals to a number. Now my goal is to solve for K. So to solve for K, okay, how do we go from the step above? How do you go from here to here? Okay, if you write it out as a fraction, what you have will be 333 over 55. Okay, so you have a fraction equals to a fraction, right? But if you remember what's the meaning of fraction, fraction means divide. So if I have 44 over 86 point K, what we are saying essentially is 44 divided by 86 minus K. And this will give me this particular value over here. Okay, so how this will look like? Okay, all of you learn distance, speed, and time in primary school. Have you all seen this triangle before? Yes, right? This means right, distance divided by speed gives me time. Distance divided by time gives me speed. It is the same example over here. Why? Because we have 44 divided by 86 minus K to give me 333 3, 3 over 500. So in other words, if you want to look for 86 minus K, what you can do is you can take 44 divided by 333 3, 3 over 500. This is the first method you can consider, right? Without multiplying both sides. It's the same concept as your speed triangle. If you understand the rationale behind the speed, you will understand this triangle. Then from here, you will solve for K, right? What we are doing here in the solution is we are removing the fraction. And how to remove a fraction is you multiply both sides. By the denominator. Okay, which in this case, my denominator is 86 minus K. So this is how I end up with a total of this portion over here because I multiply both sides by my denominator. And then from here, you will solve for K. Okay? So take note, for algebra, remember, you want the unknown to be on one side. Okay, that's the most important thing. Okay, take some time to... Absorb this. Anybody got a question? If no question, I'll move on to the next question already. Okay. Okay. Moving on. What example four? What example? Okay. What example four? You have a storybook that goes for forty five dollars and fifty cents per copy. At a book fair, it was sold at a discount of twenty percent. Okay, if a customer purchases the complete book series, which comprises of three books, a further 15% discount will be given on the total cost. So the word further means it is a discount on top of my previous discount. Okay, now in part A, you are to calculate the discounted price of one storybook. 
So what we know is my original price is $45.50. And because you have a discount of 20%, okay, right now my original is always 100%. This is something that you must take note of. Original will always be known as your 100%. So if my original is 100%, I discount by 20%. The word discount means you minus 20%. So right now, you are 100%. You deduct away 20%. You are left with 80%. So what we are looking for now in part A is 80%. So we know that 100% is $45.50. To look for 80%, it will be same thing, whatever you're looking for, divided by whatever we have, multiplied by what this 100% represent. Okay, so from here, you will get Okay, so this $36.40 is the cost of one discounted book. Now Peter buys four storybooks. So out of these four storybooks, because of what? The question said there is a complete book series which consists of three books. So out of these four books, three of it is a complete series. One of it is just a discounted price on its own, which we know is $36.40. So when you buy a complete book series, the question said that there will be a further 15% on the total cost. So now the question is, for this complete series, how much does it cost in total? Right? If one book is $36.40, if you were to buy a total of three books, it will be $36.40 times three, which will give me $109.40. So your further 15% discount is applied on the total cost of these three books, which is $109.20. So if you want to find my total cost, same thing. Your original is always 100%. Now you are applying 15% to this number over here, which means this number over here has to be my original price of 100%. And if you're applying a discount of 15%, you will now be at 85%. So same working, 85%, 85 over 100 times my total cost of these three books. Okay, so this will be my final cost for three books. But Peter bought four. So there is one more book that we have to pay for which will be at a cost of $36.40. So this will give me a total of 129.22. Hey. Any questions so far? Just now, for those who missed my message, I said that there will be a Kahoot quiz later uh, after, I, after I finish going through the notes and the winner will get a uh, reward over here. How much, I won't say. So whatever I'm going through now will apply to the quiz later. So please pay attention, especially for percentage and number pattern. Okay. Moving on to work example number five. Okay. So this is when we talk about GST. Okay, the thing about GST now is that sometimes in your school papers, they will not tell you how many percentage is it. They expect you to know when you read the news. That's assuming you read the news, right? So in case you don't know, in this, in this case, you put it down for you already, it's 9%, okay? So GST is what you apply on everything that you buy. So if I were to buy like a sofa, for example, in this case, you have to pay for GST. If I want to buy this computer over here, I have to also pay for GST. You want to buy for this tea at a restaurant, you must also pay for GST. So it's applied to everything that you purchase, unless the question said it doesn't include. So in this case, the selling price is 2,502 after 9% GST. So this is not my original because you are imposing a GST on it. So it's not my original, 
price of my sofa. And I always talk about this, right? Original is always 100%. So if the question is looking for the price of the sofa before GST, essentially they are looking for 100%. Okay. And after you apply this GST, you are paying $2,502. So I'm applying a 9% GST on my original price, which is 100%. So your final price will actually be 100% plus 9%. You give me 109%. And this 109% is 2502 So therefore, if this is 109%, you are looking for my original, which is 100%. You're working, same thing. Whatever you're looking for, over whatever you have, multiplied by my price. Okay, which will give me 2295.41. Two decimal place, because this is money. So remember, money is always in two decimal place. Okay, moving on to part B. Thomas sold a watch to Melissa at a profit of 20% and Melissa sold it to John at a profit of 30%. If John paid $920 for the watch, how much did Thomas pay for? So there, there are two phases in this, right? Thomas sold it to Melissa first, Melissa then sold it to John. So when we are calculating how much you want to find out how much Thomas paid, you must first find out how much did Melissa paid. So Melissa sold it to John at a profit of 30%. So profit means what? You earn 30%. So if I pay 100% at first, are you getting back 100%? No, right? You are getting more than 100%. How much more? 30% more. So what Melissa collected from John is actually 130%. This is for Melissa. So Melissa collected 130% from John. And this 130% is $920. So we need to find out what is the amount of money that Melissa brought it for so that we will know how much it, Thomas collect from her. right? So whatever amount that Melissa collected, it will always be her original. And original is always 100%. So we will take 100%, so 100 over 130 times 920. which will give me a fraction over here. Okay, so in this case, your final answer, remember if it's money, you cannot write as a fraction, but because this is not my final answer, it is my working, so you can write it as a fraction. Okay, so this is how much Melissa paid to Thomas, which means for Thomas, in this question, Thomas gained a profit of 20%. So that means if Thomas paid 100%, a profit of 20% means he collected 120%. And we have found out that he collected a total of this particular sum over here. So this particular sum over here is my 120%. So if you are looking for how much he paid at first, that is your 100%, right? So 100% is my original. So how much did he pay for the watch? We know what's 120%. We are looking for what is 100%. So it will be 100 over 120 times this. Okay, and this will give me, now this is your final answer. So you will present it in two decimal place. Okay, moving on to our next page. So this is our practice on your own question, which you can go back and do on your own. But one question that I want to go through here 
take note, uh, pay very close attention to this question that I'm going through because it might appear again. Okay, so we take a look at question number three. Question said what? 13% of a number is 1157. Question is looking for original number. So today you hear me talk about this original number a lot of times already. Original is how many percent? 100%, thank you. So we are looking for a 100%, okay? So 100 over 13 times 1157. Okay, which will give me 8,900. 8, okay, so take note, when you see a question like this, this is how you solve it. Your question is always 100%. Okay, take note of the working here, uh, you might see it again. So now in the exam, if you want to check your answer, how to make sure your answer is correct in the exam, okay? Assuming you have extra time. Uh. So this is my original number, correct? Then the question is what? 13% of this number is 1157. So how do you check your answer? You must find, must find out for me what is 13% of 8,900. So you take 13 over 100 times 8900. Punch in the calculator and you must see 1157. If you don't see 1157, means your answer is wrong. Then you have to go back and check again. But take note, this portion over here cannot be written down in your exam. Uh. It's your working. So do it in your head or you can key in the calculator. Okay, so no questions. Let's move on to our next chapter, which is on number pattern. So number pattern is probably the hardest topic in sec one, okay, because it is not so easy to understand. And especially when they ask you for, uh, maybe like pattern number 100, pattern number 200, right? Because you can't possibly key in the calculator all the way until pattern number 100. So you have to learn how to find this thing called the general pattern, which means what pattern does every term follow? Once you know that, you can find for whichever pattern number that they ask you, even if it goes up to 200, 300, 400. Okay? So first thing first, when we talk about number pattern, you must always look out for what is the difference. Meaning to say, as you move on from one pattern to the other, what's your change? Whether it's a plus, minus, times, or divide. Okay? So over here, take note, when the question asks you to find your general term, it means your nth term. So why is there an unknown over here called nth? Because we don't know what pattern number this is. But what we do know is that this particular pattern will give you any term in the sequence. As long as you can sub in my value of n. The value of n is always my term number. So for example, my first term, my term number is 1. My second term, my term number is 2. My third term, my term number is 3, so and so forth. Okay, so we look at what example one straight away. Okay, so number pattern is easier for you to understand when you have example questions. Okay, and one thing to take note of, uh, for number pattern, the questions will not repeat. Like for example, today you see this, doesn't mean in your exam you will see this. But the concepts you learn are what you can apply to whichever question you encounter. So we look at this question, you have three patterns, and each of the patterns is made up of similar squares. So over here, part A asks me to derive a relationship between the number of rows and the pattern number. So number of rows, rows means what? When you count from this direction. So like for example, in this classroom, this is my first row, second row, third row. I have a total of three rows. So over here, you can see pattern number one, you have two rows. Pattern number two, you have three rows. Pattern number, sorry, pattern number two, you have three rows. Pattern number three, you have Four rows. So the question is asking me to derive a relationship between my number of rows and my pattern number. So it is between your pattern number and your number of rows. So we look at the first example over here. This is pattern number one, which means it's term number one. If it's term number one, if it's term number one means what? N is equal to one. 
Pattern number two means n equals to two. Pattern number three means n equals to three. So you want to find a relationship between my number of rows and my pattern number. You will realize, okay, when n is one, I have two rows. When n is two, I have three rows. When n is three, I have four rows. So for this example, it's very straightforward. You can all tell, right? Whatever pattern number I have, you just need to plus one and you will get the number of rows. So therefore, your relationship, it will just be number of rows is equals to n plus one. So this is the general term for my number of rows. So in the event, the question asks you, how many rows does term number 100 have? It will be just 100 plus one, which is 105. Okay, moving on, in the next question, you are asked to find the relationship between the number of rows and the total number of squares. So, we take a look at my number of rows again. So, in this case, we have pattern number one, we have two rows and three squares. So, S stands for squares, R stands for rows. Pattern number two, we have three rows and five squares. Pattern number three, I have four rows and seven squares. So if you take a look at my number of squares, okay, your change is from three square to five square, seven square. So from here, you are adding two, adding two. So every pattern as you move along, as your number of rows increases, your number of squares increases by two. So every term you are adding by two, this is what we call a common difference. Common difference is when you are constantly adding by the same number. And in this case, my common difference is two. Okay. Sorry, give me a minute. Okay, so back to the question, right? So since we've identified our common difference is two, when you have a common difference, you can easily identify the pattern for me. So what's the trick behind this, okay? So in this case, because we are talking about number of rows, we are going to let it be R. So let's say if I tell you how many rows I have, you're able to tell me how many squares I have. So in this case, if it's a common difference, the start of your formula, which we call the nth term, Okay, the start of the formula will always have my common difference, which is 2. So in this case, my common difference is 2. Multiplied by my other unknown, which is the number of rows. Okay, so when we look at this example, okay, I start with a 2R, whereby R represents my number of rows. So R represents number of rows. 2 is just my common difference. So we take a look at this. And then we take a look at our first example over here. In the first example over here, I have two rows. If I have two rows, means in this formula over here. Okay, sorry. Asking for yeah, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry, back to the lesson. So where, where where was I? Uh okay, number of rows and my common difference, right? So we look at the first example over here. You have two rows. So if you apply these two rows into my formula what you will have is 2 times 2, right? Because I have two rows, so 2 times 2. 
and two times two gives me what? Four. But according to my pattern, how many squares do I have? I have three squares. So how do I go from four squares to three squares? Minus one. So we will try minus one, right? Because minus one will give me three, which is my number of rows. So let's go and try my pattern to be 2r minus 1. So this is the so-called nth term that we have, which means every term will follow this pattern. We look at the second example. Huh? Second example tells me what? When I have three rows, I have five squares. You apply the formula and the information given. You will have 2 times 3 minus 1. Key this in the calculator and you will see 5. Does it match number of squares? Yes. So therefore, this will be my formula for my nth term. But this is the relationship between what? The number of rows and the number of squares. So if you want to further improve your answer, right? Do we know what's the pattern between the term number and the number of rows already? We found it in part A, right? Over here. Number of rows is given to be n plus 1. So if you want to further improve your answer, Sub this in, you will get 2 bracket n plus 1 minus 1. So this will give me 2n plus 1. Whereby n is my what? Term number. Okay? So your general term, remember, you're always, you have to always use your common difference, your unknown, and then you go and check what are the changes you must make such that you can derive your final answer. Okay, next for part three, your pattern number and your parameter of the figure. So parameter means you count the outline, right? The, the length outside. So since these figures are made of identical squares, okay, it means that the lengths are also the same. So what I need you to go and count is your parameter. So from here, you have eight, Then here you have 12, here you have 16. So this is my parameter for the respective patterns, right? 8, 12, and 16. So don't need to count, I count for you. And from here, you notice <coughs> the pattern is what? It's plus 4. It's plus 4. So and so on. So if it's plus 4 and plus 4, we straight away can derive for my nth term, you will always start with your common difference, which in this case is 4, and my unknown, which is my term number, so it's n. Then afterwards, after you derive this step, you ask yourself, uh, for the first term over here, n is equals to 1. If n is equals to 1, 4n will be equals to 4 times 1 to give me 4. But is my actual parameter 4? It's not. It's 8. So how to go from 4 to 8? You plus 4, exactly. Very good. Finish. Then of course, check in the exams whether the other patterns follow this trend. Because just because it fits 1 doesn't mean it fits all. Okay, n term is supposed to, to it's supposed to fit every term in this pattern. So you have to be very careful. So once I derive all the relationship, okay, B for part B is very simple already. For pattern number 10, my number of rows will just be n plus 1. So 10 plus 1 equals to 11. From here. My number of squares will just be 2n plus 1. So 2 bracket 10 plus 1 to give me 21. My parameter will just be here. 4 times 10 plus 4 to give me 44. So do you realize the moment you have your general term, it doesn't matter which term number they want you to find, you can solve it. But if you don't identify, sure, for pattern 10, you can use calculator and plus, plus, plus. For pattern 142, can you do that? Cannot. So please do not have the idea that, okay, you're going to use calculator to plus, plus, plus. Your calculator cannot fit until plus 142 times, you don't have that much time in the exam as well. Okay? So for part 
2, my number of rows will be 1, 4, 2 plus 1. My number of squares will just be 2 times 1, 4, 2 plus 1. Okay, my, num my parameter will just be 4 times 1, 4, 2 plus 4. Goes to Okay, so the answer at the for second part is not the important one. The important one is how you derive <coughs> these formulas over here. Okay, you will see this again very soon. Okay, you have one more chance to understand this and ask if you have any questions. Any questions? Okay, no, ah. Uh. Okay, moving on for example two. So you must draw diagram five in the space below. So you have to first identify for me what's my pattern. Okay, what are the changes? From diagram one to diagram two, you can see there is an additional dot over here, additional dot over here, additional dot over here for diagram number two. Okay, then from diagram number two to diagram number three, additional dot over here, over here, and over here. So that means if you want to draw diagram number five, what you need to do is add one dot over here, add one dot over here, and add one dot over here. So this will be fifth diagram. Okay. So from here, part B asked me to find out how many dots I have in diagram number nine. So as you can see from my drawings, or rather you see from the pattern itself, uh, you will know that when you go from 1 to 2, you plus 3 dots. From 2 to 3, you plus 3 dots. From 3 to 4, you plus 3 dots. Right? So from here, you know my common difference is what? It's plus 3. Part B is very simple. It's just diagram 9. So you can keep adding 3 and 3 and 3 and 3. But first, you must know how many dots I have. Right? So I started with 4 dots. 7. 10, 13. Okay? So that means if you want to find diagram 5, it will be 13 plus 3. 6 will be plus another 3. 7, 8, 9. So this will give me a total of 28 dots. So this is for diagram 9. right? So diagram 9, you can still do this. If they give you diagram 90, you cannot do this anymore. Okay? And why am I doing this instead of, high, if, instead of finding the general term? Okay, In exams, I want you to take note of something. There is a flow for a reason. There is part A, part B, part C for a reason. Part C asks me to find an expression in terms of n. This means you are finding my nth term. Which means, logically speaking, you only can find your nth term in part C. So if you find it in part B, you are disrupting the flow of the question already. Okay? So when you look at part C, you are to find my nth term. We all know by now, what's my common difference? Thank you. I don't know what's the name, but 3, very good. So you always start with a 3n. Okay? Always. Where n is my what? Term number. So we test, uh, diagram number 1 over here. Diagram number 1. My term number is 1, so n equals to 1. If n equals to 1, what's the value of 3n, Isabel? If n equals to 1, 3n is 3, right? But this is 4. So how to go from 3 to 4? You must. What must you do? Uh, plus 1, very good. So therefore, there will be a plus one at the back. Okay. Then afterwards, of course, you cannot just say, okay, this is my final answer after I try it one time. You must be careful. So you go and check. For diagram number four, n is equals to four. So according to my formula, you will get three times four plus one to give me 13. Does it match? It matches. So is my answer correct? Yes. Okay, part D say that you must explain why it is not possible to have a diagram with one, two, eight dots. 
So we have already found out for me what is my expression to find the number of dots, which is given by 3n plus 1. So this nth term over here will apply to every term in this pattern. So it means that 3n plus 1 is my number of dots. And what we are asked to find is 1 to 8. So we will equate 3n plus 1 to be equal to 1 to 8. And from here, 3n is equal to 1 to 7. So what we want to solve for when we see a question like this is to solve for the value of n. So if you keep this in the calculator, you will realize that you will get a fraction like this. But if you go and think about it, what does n represent? What does n represent? The term number, right? So term number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So all these term numbers, they are all known as what? Whole numbers. So can you have a term that is 42 and 1 third? No. So therefore, the explanation is very simple and straightforward. Since n is not an integer, the diagram does not exist. Okay, so a few things to note about n, uh, which is my term number. Term number cannot be negative, decimal, or fraction. Okay, your term number must be positive integer. So if question ever asks you on whether a pattern like that exists, your what you need to go and do is to find out for me what is my term number. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to our last work example of number pattern. Okay. Okay. So what example three, once again, you are given the solution already because it's a kind of tricky question. So the question wants you to find the expression for Tn. And over here, they give you another formula, right? where you see this chunk of numbers over here. But this formula is what you will learn in upper sec slash JC, right? So if you want to follow the same trick that I taught you just now, first step, okay, let me write down for you, uh, what's the first step? Spot the common difference. Okay, this is your first step. Your second step is to have an equation of common difference times term number, which is n. So I'll just write n. Okay. Then your third step is to check what changes must be made. Meaning to say you go and check if n equals to one, how, how much does my value differ? What must I do such that I can get the answer? Your last step, is to check with all the terms after you derive your pattern. After you derive your nth term, you always check with all your terms. Okay, so for this example over here, you are constantly adding by three. So that's my first step. My difference is three. My second step is what? Finding my difference times my n, which is in this case, three n. Then what's my third step? Yeah, right over here. My third step is to ask yourself, if it's term number one, it will be three times one, which will give me three. But evidently from the pattern, what does my first term say? It's one. So now you ask yourself, how do you go from three to one to minus two? This is how you derive one. So that means what you have is three n minus two. So now you go and check with all the pattern. If it's term number two, if it's term number three, term number five, does it match? 
you follow these four steps, I can guarantee you, you will always be able to find what is the answer. Okay, but take note, uh, this only works for common difference question, which 90% of the time you're tested on common difference, as that one. But of course, there are other things like perfect squares, perfect cubes, which you must also understand. Okay? So we look at next pattern, I mean, next part, right? You have a fraction over here. So as you can see from your working that we have provided for you, we express everything as a fraction. And we express in a fraction such that we can see what is the change. Numerator is always plus three. Denominator is always plus two. Or rather, yeah, plus two. Or, or they're all even numbers, like two, four, six, eight, ten. So my numerator is the same as my previous part, which is why it's three n minus two. And my denominator is just two n because they're all even numbers. So multiples of two. So two times one, two times two, so on. So this is for even numbers. Okay, last part is kind of tricky, right? When they say that a student observes that QN is an increasing sequence and claims that there are two numbers, QK and Q2K, such that the difference between the two numbers is one over four. I mean, one over 44. So for this part over here, what we need to do is for UK, okay, what you need to sub is that N is equals to K. So what you need to do is, if I have my formula to be 3n minus 2, or 2n, okay. The question over there, instead of qn, must be un. Uh, okay, so take note. So now, whichever pattern number I have, instead of writing n, you replace with k. Instead of writing n for the other one, you write as 2k. So you will just substitute and replace all the n's with a k or a 2k. So this is why eventually for UK, this is what you get. For U2K, this is what you get. Okay. And according to the question, the difference between the two numbers is 1 over 44. Okay. So difference means you take the bigger number minus the smaller number. So how do I know which one is bigger? Because the question said it's an increasing sequence. Which means the bigger your term number, the higher your value. So between K and 2K, 2K is higher which is why I take 2k minus k, okay? And then from here, you make the denominator the same, you can solve for k. So this one, I won't explain too much because I want to talk about your perfect square and perfect cubes, which you will be finding it useful in a bit, okay? So sidetrack a bit, uh, add this portion in, in your notes. I think you have the blank space there to write down. So let's say you have this pattern over here. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, so and so forth. When you see a number like this, or rather every time you see a number pattern, the first question you ask yourself is, is the difference always the same? Meaning to say, do you always add the same number? One look at this, you know you're not adding the same number, right? It's plus 3, plus 5, plus 7, plus 9. Second thing afterwards, if you realize that you don't get a common difference, I need you to go and check. What are all these numbers known as? Oh, very good. So you can rewrite as one square, two square, three square, four square, five square. And another thing from here, once you have this, uh, you're able to tell, right? If this is my term number one, n equals to one. Term number two, n equals to two, so and so forth. Where else have you seen this one and two? Over here. So what does that mean? It means that for my nth term, so ask yourself, uh, if it's pattern number five, you square five. So if it's pattern number 10, you will square 10. So if it's pattern number n, you will square n. Very good. So you just get n squared. The same concept applies for cube. So perfect square, perfect cube must be very clear. But let me just tell you this, in your exam at sec one, you either test on common difference, perfect square, or perfect cube. So if it's not a common difference, if it's not a perfect square, it means it has to be a perfect cube. So let me just give you an example of perfect cube. Ah. 1, 8, 27, 64, 1, 2, 5, so and so forth. Okay? Respectively, they are 1 cube, 2 cube, 3 cube, 4 cube, and 
five cube. Okay, let me just share a bit about a perfect cube. So just in case you don't know how to spot. So you see numbers like this to test, just need a cube root. You cube root one, two, five, you will see five. You cube root 64, you will see four, so and so on. Okay. With that, we will conclude polygons. I'm sorry. Number pattern, we'll move on to polygons, okay? Before I move on, sorry, any questions on common difference, how to find nth term? You will need to use it very often, ah. Huh? Okay, I'm assuming no questions, right? Okay. Next, your polygons. Okay, for polygons, um, you learn this in your areas of triangle, quadrilateral, rectangle, that topic, right? So over here, we have a few different terms that we must take note of. You have a convex polygon, which means your interior angle is less than 180. You have a concave polygon, which means your interior angle is more than 180. The important thing that you need to take note over here is that in your regular polygon, all sides are equal length. Okay, which means all interior angles are also equal. Which also means all exterior angles are equal. So what are interior exterior angles? I'll go through them in a bit. I just need to take note of this portion over here first. So the keyword is what? Regular. If the question never say regular, you cannot assume. <clears throat> okay, afterwards. Question say what? Question say sum of interior angles is and oh sorry sorry the table so this table over here you have number sites from 3 to 10 set to say you have to memorize this in the exam okay so that's the harsh reality yeah, you must memorize them i think 3 and 4 is not the issue it's 5 to 10 onwards that's the issue so you have to take some time to get memorized okay anything more than 10 there will be known, known as a end gun which means if I, have, if I have 11 sites Okay, it will be known as the 11 gun. So 12 sides, 12 gun, 13 sides, 13 gun, so on and so on. Okay, whereby what does N represent? Okay, so now if you're looking at this formula, then you're wondering, right, what does all these values of N represent? N represents your number of sides. So number of sides in a polygon is represented by the letter N. And at the same time, it also represents my number of Angles. So if you ever forget this portion in the exam, go and ask yourself. A triangle has three sides. And a triangle has also three angles. Okay? So N represents number of sides slash number of angles. So my sum of interior angles, which means all your angles inside add up together, is given by the formula N minus 2 times 180. This will always be true. Okay, to test this, we try on triangle. Triangle has three sides. Means what? 3 minus 2 times 180. You give me 180. Is it true that angle sum of triangle is 180? Yes, right? So this formula makes sense. Okay. Then afterwards, the question talk about one interior angle in the end gun. So take note. Over here, what are they talking about? Okay. First thing first, can you put another side track here? This only applies to regular polygon. Okay, this only applies to regular polygon, whereby what? Every angle is equal to each other. Okay? So when we look at a diagram, like this example over here, the word interior means you're on the inside. So if you're on the inside of the diagram, your angles are mainly this. P, P, Q, R, S. So these are my interior angles. If I'm looking for my sum of interior angles, okay, what you will do is, very simple, right? You'll add all the angles up together. P plus T plus S plus R plus Q. That is what you will do. 
But on the other side, you have also this formula such that the sum of interior angles is given to be n minus 2 times 180, whereby n is my number of sides. From here, you can count. I have five sides, which means what you will have is also 5 minus 2 times 180. And what does that give me? 540 degrees. So all these angles adds up to 540 degrees, right? Assuming this is a regular polygon, are my angles equal? Yes, right? My, my angles are equal, right? So means P is equals to T equals to S equals to R equals to Q. You want to find one interior angle. We added five together to give me 540. So how to find one? You take 540 divided by five to give me 108. So each of these angles will be 108, 108, 108, 108, and 108. But when does this apply? Only when it's a regular polygon because all my angles are the same. That is why we can divide. If they are not the same, we cannot divide. Okay. Next, we are talking about exterior angles. So what are exterior angles? Okay. Just now we talk about interior angles, which are the angles inside. Your exterior angles, okay, one exterior angle can be found by taking 180 minus one interior angle. Not 360, yeah, 180. A lot of students in the exam, they will forget about this and they write 360. Okay, then from there, everything will be wrong. Already. So take note, it's 180. It's always your adjacent angles on a straight line. So your sum of exterior angles over here will always end up to 360 degrees. This is always true. So you can always use this formula when it comes to a fraction on polygons. But when do you use the next formula, the fraction over here? Same as whatever I said at the top, it only applies to Regular polygon. So take note, uh, these two that I'm highlighting in orange only applies to regular polygons. Okay? Okay, moving on. Moving on, we have more example number one. In the figure below, you have a regular polygon. Regular polygon means all the angles are equal to each other. Okay? And if you're going to count, there are a total of six sides. Which means you can find what is one interior angle. Okay? What is one interior angle in this case? It will be 180 times 6 minus 2 divided by 6 because I have six sides. So this will give me 120 degrees. So all my interior angles are 120 degrees. Okay, so this will also be 120 degrees. Then afterwards, the question wants you to find the sum of all unknown angles, which is x plus y plus z. Okay, and then from here, I know some of you will say, okay, this is a 90 degrees because it looks like one. Okay, but factually speaking in a textbook, there is no property that tells you this is a 90 degrees. Okay, it's always an assumption. So the safest way to do this in the exam is to go and goof to me and go and find the angles. Right? In a regular polygon, all the lengths are equal, which means this triangle over here is also known as an isosceles triangle. So that means you can find for me what is angle T U S by doing 180 minus 120 divided by 2 to give me 30 degrees. And the reasoning is my base angles of isosceles triangle. So once I know this is 30 degrees, the entire blue angle is 120. The red angle is 30. So if you want to find for me what is angle PUS, it will be simply 120 minus 30 degrees. Okay, to give you 90 degrees. So yes, you can assume that 90 degrees, but there is no working, there's no reasoning. So to be safe, 
always show your working as to why he's like this. Then afterwards, this is another triangle. And now that I know that it's a 90 degrees over here, you can find that angle Z plus angle Y plus 90 is equal to 180 degrees because it is inside a triangle. So my reasoning here is going to be angle sum of triangle. So therefore, if you want to find Z plus Y, it will just be 90 degrees. So Z plus Y is 90 degrees. X is 120. My sum will just be 120 plus 90 degrees to give me 210. Okay, moving on to our second more example. Alan claims that three of the exterior angles of an irregular nonagon, so irregular means not all the angles are equal, not all the lengths are equal. Nonagon has a total of nine sides. So I know three of them, x plus 30, 2x minus 6, 5x plus 40. And the remaining exterior angles are 55 degrees each. So out of these nine, he knows three, and the rest are all equal. So there's a total of 6 over here at 55 degrees each. And what do we learn about exterior angles? The sum of exterior angles is always equal to 360. So my sum of exterior angles will always be equal to 360 degrees. So from here, you have x plus 30 plus 2x minus 6 plus 5x plus 14 that's my first three angles. Then I have six more angles left at 55 each. So this will give me 360. Expand this entire equation and simplify and you will get 8x plus 38 plus 330 equals to 360. And what does that calculate to me? It tells me that 8x is equals to negative 8. Which means x is equal to negative 1. Then afterwards, you must ask yourself, does this make sense? Where do we see x in my angles? If x is negative 1, this will be negative 1 plus 30 to give me 29. Does it make sense? Yes. This will be 2 bracket negative 1 minus 6 to give me negative 8. Does this make sense? Can my angle be negative? No. Therefore, what can we say? Can x be negative 1? They're not. And how do you derive negative 1? Because of his claim. So what can we say now? Inaccurate. As x cannot be negative. Okay, afterwards, work example 3, we have this figure below, PQ, RS, T, U, V, W is a regular octagon. Octagon has 8 sides. You also have a square, typo as a square. And you have X, W, Y, Z, which is part of a regular angle, but I don't know how many sides I have. I only have part of it. So from here, first question asks you to find what is angle VWX, which is over here. Okay, so that's the first portion that we must find. So for me to find that, you will realize that this is what we can make use of angles at a point. A corner of a square is 90 degrees. So that is for sure we know. So that means the last angle we must find is this particular angle over here, PWB. So you're going to find for me what is PWB. So to find PW, PWB, Right, this is a interior angle inside of an octagon. So therefore, your formula 180 times 8 minus 2 
This gives me my what? My sum of interior angles divided by my number of interior angles, which is eight. This will give me one three five degrees. Then afterwards, you want to find B W X. It will just be three sixty degrees minus one three five degrees minus ninety degrees to give me one three five. So what reasoning are we going to use here? Angles at a point. Okay, it is good practice for you to write down the reasonings for every uh, trigo things that you did. Okay, for every formulas or equations that you write down. Next portion asks me for UVZ, which is over here. So I already know that this is a regular octagon. So this must be 135. This must also be 135 because it's a regular polygon. It means every interior angle is equal. So same, you want to find what is UVZ. It would just be 360 minus 135 minus 135. Give me 90 degrees. Okay, so same thing. Uh. Angles at a point. Third part asks me to find what's angle VPX. So let me erase a bit of my diagram. VPX, you must draw your own line from here to here, from here to here. Okay, so the angle we're looking for is this entire thing over here. And you can see it's made up of two different angles, VPW and WPX. So first thing you're going to write down, VPX is equal to VPW plus WPX. So from here, what we need to go and find is what's VPW. And since this is a regular polygon, and I know my interior angle is 135, my interior angle is 135, a regular polygon means this particular triangle over here that I'm drawing like this, is also known as an isosceles triangle because my sides are the same. This is a regular polygon. So therefore, if you want to find what is angle VPW, it's because of your isosceles triangle. So 180 minus 135 divided by 2 to give me 22.5 degrees. Because of base angles of isosceles triangle. Then, of course, WPX is when you cut the square into half diagonally. When you cut the square diagonally like this, this angle in between must be 45. So therefore, BPX will just be 22.5 plus 45 degrees to give me 67.5 There is no reasoning for this. Okay, for part four, I think it's very straightforward. You must have uh, thought about it when you saw that my interior angles are the same for both. They are both 135 and they're both regular polygons. They're both regular polygons. They got the same interior angle. means they must also have the same number of sides. So therefore, N must be equal to 8. Finish. Same as my octagon because my interior angles are the same. So take note for this. Uh, interior angle, same. Same interior angle equals to same number of sides. Okay, moving on to the next page. Work example four, you have three similar regular pentagons. AEFM is part of an n-sided regular polygon. So you must find angle AED, which is over here. So I think for part one, it's not the issue anymore. Okay, AED is just one interior angle, which we can find. Mm. 
you will have AED, right, which is 180 times 5 minus 2 divided by 5. So this will give me 180. So that's that, okay? Very straightforward. Okay, then afterwards, you want to find what is DCH, which is over here. Before you can do that, you must find for me what is CDH. Because we all know by now, if they are all similar regular pentagons, means my sides has to be equal, which means this is an isosceles triangle. So third time we are seeing this already today. So from here, what you must find for me is what is angle CDH. So to find angle CDH, I know my interior angles are 108 and 108. So that means CDH will be 360 minus 108 minus 108. Give me 144. Angles at a Okay. Then afterwards, if you want to find DCH, it will just be 180 minus 144 divided by 2 because this is an isosceles triangle. So take note, uh, always make use of isosceles triangle when it comes to regular polygons because my sides are all equal. So this is my base angles of isosceles triangle. Okay, so from here, we also know this is 108, right? Because they're all your polygons, your regular polygons, they are the same. So from here, you have 108, 108. The question asks you to find the value of N. You must first find for me what is this particular interior angle over here. Because this interior angle is part of this polygon, which we don't know how many sides there are. So we already know this 144, so angle AEF, 144. 144 is one interior angle. So if one interior angle is 144, I got n number of sides. My sum of interior angles will be 144 n. Right? Because if one is 144, n number will be 144 times n. And from the standard formula that we always use, 180 times n minus 2. So 144 n must be equal to 180 times n minus 2. Expand and you will get 180 n minus 360. And from here, all we need to do is solve for n. So therefore, you will have 36n to be equal to 360. n is equal to 10. Question? Any questions? No? Uh? Okay. So this is the end of our notes. Uh, I don't know if you've been waiting for the quiz, but we are going to do the cloud quiz. Now, everybody got phone? Okay, those online, you can also participate. This is uh, part of your revision for percentage and number pattern. Okay? Who needs Wi-Fi? Okay, so let me transit over to my cloud quiz already. Uh. Okay, so those online, feel free to join as well and participate, even though if you win, I can't give you the reward, but uh, you can always try, okay? So scan the QR code and then you can log in. It is just a fun component of the lesson. Uh. It, not every lesson or every vision event will have a cloud quiz, so please take note. is related to percentage and number pattern. Oh, that's a lot of people. Anybody need more time? No, ah. Uh. Before I start, uh, simple advice is maybe you should prepare a calculator and like a pencil to write on your notes. Okay, the last page of your notes is empty, so you can have space over there. Okay. 
Okay, I will start in 10 seconds time. So please prepare yourself. Okay, ready? The question is very simple, huh? it's about whether you're fast or not. Do you need more time to join? Okay, I wait for you. Anybody not inside yet? Or everybody inside? Are you inside? Who, who's not? Can I start already? I start already, huh? Okay, go. To our, our mock paper. So, wait, anybody here to have mock paper with you? All have? Okay, all have. Uh, for those online, let me check. Let me send the link again. Okay, I have sent the link for online students. That is your mock paper. So you can download it and view it. Okay. Part A, this is a typical question that you'll see in the exam. So read the instructions very, very carefully. Sometimes the question say to calculate, then you round off. Sometimes they say to round off, then you estimate. So in this case, they ask you to round off is to each number into three SF first before you estimate. So therefore, 412 plus 9.96 minus 12.96. Zero. This, when you key calculator, will give me an answer 409.96. Right? And the question says, leave your answers in 3SF, which means this will be 410 for your final answer. Okay, for significant figures, I don't think it is a problem for all of you. Only issue is when, if it starts with zero, like for example, if it's 0 0.0123, I mean 1432, Zeros does not count as a significant number. You start counting from one, two, and three. Okay, so this portion you must be very careful. But B asked me to simplify this equation. So first thing first, you must open up your bracket to give you five y minus two minus two bracket y minus two x. Open up the bracket. This negative two here applies to everything inside the bracket. Which means when you open up the bracket, you will get minus 2y. Then afterwards, followed by what? Followed by negative 2 times negative 2. Negative times negative gives me. Thanks for the response, guys. Negative times negative gives me. Thank you. So this will give me plus 4x. Then from here, you will get 3y plus 4x. Okay. For part C, you must fully factorize the following algebraic expressions. So when it comes to factorizing, I want you to know that factorizing means you take out what is common. And to check whether your answer is correct or not, at the end of the day, whatever that's left inside the bracket cannot have anything common. So an example, straight away you look at this, you know that P is common. So let's say I take out P first. You're left with 30x minus 
24y, okay? My unknowns are different, x and y, nothing to take out. But you look at 30 and you look at 24, is there something common you can take out? If yes, what is the number? What can I take out from 30 and 24? 6, very good. So you take out 6, you get 6p, means you're left with 5x minus 4y. And then from here, you ask yourself, uh, anything else to take out from inside? If your answer is no, means your answer is correct. Okay, finish. Then also, if you want to be extra careful in an exam, in case you didn't know, factorization is the opposite of expansion. You expand this back, what must you see? This. Okay, so there's another level of checking that you can consider in the exam if you have the time. Okay, for part two, it's slightly a bit more trickier. We took this from a difficult school. So from here, you will realize, okay, what is there common? Right, there's nothing in common because there's no 2A, it's just a B. Then you look at these brackets again. Okay, I want you to pay very close attention to these brackets. In the first bracket, I have B minus 3. My B is positive, my 3 is negative. In the second bracket, my 3 is positive and my b is negative. So the negative sign has swapped around positions, right? So the only way you want to turn this around into, you want to convert this into this, you have to factorize out the negative sign. So how do I factorize out the negative sign? You will have b bracket b minus 3. So currently, instead of writing 3 minus b, you want it to be b minus 3 because you factorize out a negative sign. So you factorize out your negative sign. So when you factorize out the negative sign, where does it go to? It goes to this in front. It goes to the variable in front of the bracket, which is negative 2a. You apply a negative to a non-negative, it becomes positive. So this minus 2a becomes plus 2a. From here, you will have this to be equal to this. So can we factorize it out since it's common? We can. So you will factorize out and get B minus three. Then what is left? B plus 2A. Very good. So you will get B plus 2A. Finish. Okay, that's it. Okay, moving on to the next question. Okay, next question here, another standard question that you will see in the exam, 100%. Okay, you are given 2, 2, 4, which is written as 2 power 5 times 7. You want to find k such that 2, 2, 4, k is both a perfect square and a perfect cube. Before we start this question, a few things we must know. When it's 2, 2, 4, k, it means it's 2, 2, 4 times k. When you have a 2, 2, 4 times k, my powers will only go up. It will never go down. That's the first thing you must take note of. Okay? Second thing to take note of, if it's a perfect square, my powers are even number. Okay, they all can be divided by two. That's the first thing. The key word here is powers. Ah. My powers must be even number. If it's a perfect cube, if it's a perfect cube, means my powers must be divisible by three. Okay, not odd number, ah. divisible by Three. So take note of this. So these are the two criteria. And this question wants it to be a perfect square, a perfect square, and a perfect cube. So now can I check for perfect square, it must be an even number. Perfect cube, it must be a number that is divisible by three. Which number is both divisible by three and is an even number? 6, very good. So you want the powers to be divisible by 6. Okay, so from here, right now, you have a 224 to be equals to 2 power 5 times 7, which means 224k is 2 power 5 times 7 times k. Okay, so from here, if you want to find out for me what is my new power, like what all of you said, right? My new power must be able to divide by, divide by, divide by 6. Thank you. So now I got 2 power 5. What's the next nearest number that can be divided by 6? Six? 6 itself. 
correct? So to go from 2 power 5 to 2 power 6, you must multiply by a 2. So therefore, k must have a 2. This is 7 power 1. You must go from 7 power 1 to 7 power 6. So that means you must multiply by 7 to the power of 5. So k will also have 7 to the power of 5. Finish. Okay, you can present this as a final answer. Or you want to evaluate, also can. Like this. Okay. Next, you want to express 42 as the product of its prime factors. So let's say we do the ladder method, divide by 2, 21, divide by 3, 7, divide by 7, 1. So therefore, 42 is just equal to 2 times 3 times 7. I think this portion no issue. Okay. For highest common factor, okay, since I'm talking about HCF, let me just cover LCM as well. HCF was my criteria, very simple. You only can choose common factors. That's the first criteria. Which means the factor must appear in both numbers. That's the first criteria. Second criteria, when they are common, means they have different powers. So which power do I choose? Lower power. Okay, follow this and you will be able to find for me my HCF. For LCM, same thing, two criteria. You choose everything. Don't need to be common. So you choose everything. And your second criteria is you choose the highest power. So if they are common, you choose the highest power. So it's complete opposite from HCF. So therefore, in this question, you have 224 to be 2 power 5 times 7, 42 to be 2 times 3 times 7. So if you want to find your HCF, HCF, you must choose what's common. And in this case, what's common is 2. So between 2 power 5 and 2 power 1, you only can choose 2. Then can I choose 3? I can't choose 3, right? Because 3 doesn't appear in 2, 2, 5, 2, 2, 4. So I can choose 7, and they are both 7 power 1. So it's just 2 times 7 to give me 14. Finish. Okay. Last portion, they say that two timers are set, off, set to go off at intervals of 42 and 224 minutes, given that the alarm clocks ring together at 10 a.m. What time will they next ring together again? So for a question like this, you must understand the context of the question. Your alarm rings every 42 minutes. So it's like 42, 86, 128, so and so forth. The other one rings at 224 minutes. So it's like 224, 448, so and so forth. So if you want to find the time whereby they will ring together, it means that they have to ring at the same time. Same time means you must find for me my LCM of 42 and 224. This is the same question as, you know, I think you have seen this by now, the train question whereby there's a red light, green light, yellow light flash together at the same time. Every time they ask for something that happens simultaneously at the same time, it's always my LCM. The most common one is your red light, green light, yellow light. Okay, so from here, you must find your LCM of 42 and 224. So your criteria here is what? You choose everything. And if it's common, you choose the higher power. So between 2 power 5 and 2, you choose 2 power 5. 3 didn't appear in both, but you can still choose it. And of course, there is a 7. So this gives me 672 minutes. The question asks you for what time will they next meet together again. So first thing first, when it's 672 minutes, you must find for me how many hours and how many minutes it is. So what you can do is you can divide this by 60. Divide this by 60 to convert from minutes to hours, you will have 11 whole, 1 over 5 hours. But if you want to actually convert into a timing, it means you must have hours and minutes, the 11 here stands for 11 hours. The 1 over 5 over here, you must convert into minutes. How to convert from hours to minutes? How to convert from hours to minutes? 1 hour is how many minutes? 
60. So you times 60, and this will give me 12 minutes. So therefore, they will ring again 11 hours and 12 minutes from 10 a.m. So therefore, the final answer will just be 9, 12 p.m. Okay? Okay, moving on. Question three. Mr. Lim drives at an average speed of X km per hour for 45 minutes and then for another 30 minutes at an average speed of 1.4 X km per hour. So over here, we have this triangle once again because it involves what? Distance, speed, and time. Okay, so you have your distance, speed, and your time. So over here, you have average speed of 8x km per hour for 45 minutes and then 30 minutes at an average speed of 1.4x km per hour. Okay, so from here you must find the distance traveled in the first 45 minutes. So distance is given to be what according to this formula? Distance is given to be speed times time. So when you derive this, the next thing that you must be careful about is your units. Because if you look at your units for my distance in the first 45, my speed is in km. It's km per hour. So if you want to multiply with your time, your time must also be in hours. But now I have it in minutes. How to go from minutes to hours? You go from hours to minutes is time 60. You go backwards, divide by 60. So therefore, it will be 45 minutes divided by 60. So this is my speed times time. From here, you evaluate this, you will get 45x over 60. How to simplify your answer? Very simple. You just press in the calculator 45 over 60 without the x. You will see 3 over 4. Then now you put back the x. So from here, you will get 3x over 4 km. This is for part A. Okay, moving on. For part B, the question said to find the total distance traveled for the whole journey. So this journey is made up of two parts. First, 45 minutes, and then the next 30 minutes. So the next 30 minutes, we don't know what is our uh, distance. So you have to find for me what is my distance. So distance for 30 minutes. Same thing, you use your speed times your time. So that will be 1.4x times 30 minutes, you must convert to hours, so 30 divided by 6. This will give me 7 over 10 x km. So therefore, if you want to calculate your total distance, you take the first 45 minutes plus the last 30 minutes, 3x over 4 plus 7x over 10. Then from here, same thing. How do you evaluate this in the calculator? Ignore the x, press into the calculator 3 over 4 plus 7 over 10. You will see 29 over 20. Then now you put back your x. Okay, so just because there's an x or an unknown doesn't mean you cannot use calculator. Huh? So from here, you can either write in this or write in. Okay. For part C, you must find your average speed. Formula for average speed. Okay, it's not you find the speed, then you find the average. That's not how it works. Huh? So you don't ever find for me two different speeds and find the average of the speed. It's always my total distance over my total time. So my total distance, I calculate already 1.45x. My time, I don't know, but I know my total time in minutes, which is what? My total time is given to be your 45 minutes plus your 30 minutes to give me 75 minutes. Okay, 
Same thing, you must convert your 75 minute hours because we are working with 60 km, I mean, sorry, 75 km per hour. So convert the minutes to hours, 25 over 60, and this will give me 5 over 4 hours. So if you want to find your average speed, total distance is 29 over 20x, total time is 5 over 4 hours. Average speed, your total distance, 29x over 20, divided by my total time, which is 5 over 4. So you have a fraction divided by a fraction, not very nice. So we do our basics from primary school, right? Division of fraction is do what? The three magical words. Keep, keep change flip, thank you. So keep the first portion, change the sign to times, and you flip the last fraction. Uh, then from here, then it's easier for you to do it. Same thing, you can key in the calculator. Everything you see here except the x. So 29 over 20 times 4 over 5. Then you put in the x. And you will get... You will get 1.16 km per hour. So this is my average speed in terms of x. And according to the question, my average speed is equals to 75 km per hour. So therefore, 1.16x is equals to 75 km per hour. So from here, you are solving for x because they ask you to solve the equation. So solve the equation, just divide both sides by 1.16. You will have your answer to be 64 whole, 19 over. So take note for this portion over here. Every time you do your mock paper in school or your exam papers in school, right, the cover page will give you some information. Okay, so let me flip to the cover page for a while because I know nobody reads the cover page. Okay. The question here say, give non-exact numerical answers correct to 3SF or one decimal place unless a different level of accuracy is specified. So in this question, what they mean, or rather what they mean by non-exact is if you don't see a, a fraction in the calculator. So if you see a non-fraction, you see a decimal, that is non-exact. Exact means it's a fraction. So non-exact is not a fraction. So if you see a fraction, you leave it as a fraction. Okay, unless the question is talking about money or anger. Money, it must be in two decimal place. Anger must be in one decimal place. Anything else you can write as a fraction, you write it as a fraction. Because it's exact. Okay, back to the question. So from here, you have x to be equal to this. Okay, so afterwards, Mr. Lim claims that he will reach his destination earlier if he drove at a constant speed of 60k, 60 km per hour. So now that we know his total distance, his total distance is given to be 1.45x, and I already know what's x. Right, so I can find for me first what is my total distance. My total distance is 1.45x, so 1.45 times 64 whole 19 over 29. This will give me 93.75 km. Yeah. You know my total distance now, 93.75 km. So you see, no, over here I use my exact value, right, which is a fraction. If just now your fraction you convert to 3SF, you will not get 93.75. This is not a nice number anymore because you have already round off the 3SF. So it's not the most accurate answer. Okay. Total distance is 93.75. They gave you the speed, which is 60 km per hour. We must find our time. So distance and speed. How do you find time from there? How do you find time from distance and speed? Distance divided by speed. Okay, so 93.75 divided by 60. Okay, this will give me a fraction of 1 whole 9 over 16 hours.
So initially, I took 75 minutes, which we have calculated to be one whole and one over four hours. So this is new time. My old time is one whole, one over four hours. Which one take longer? My new time or my old time? New time, right? So is he correct? Is he correct? He's not correct, right? Because according to him, what did he say? He said he will reach his destination earlier, which means he will take a lesser time. But end up, he took a longer time. So he is inaccurate. So therefore, inaccurate as he will take a longer time. Finish. Okay, moving on to question number four. The figure below shows a solid matter in the form of a trapezoidal prism, which just means that your base or rather your cross-section area is a trapezium. Okay, trapezium, I believe everybody has learned this before. Now this question asks you to find the volume of the solid. This solid is a prism. Okay, what a prism means is that it is like a cylinder, but the difference is that your cross-section area is no longer a circle. Okay, so from here, you want to find your volume of prism. Okay, let me just write this at the top. Your volume of prism is always given to be your cross-section area times your height. So what's the mean of cross-section area? It means that, for example, for my bottle over here, if I cut in the middle, you will still see the same circle. So that means this circle over here is known as my cross-section area. Okay? So for this trapezium, if you were to cut the trapezium in the middle over here, let's say you cut it across this line, you will still see this trapezium over here. Okay? So therefore, my cross-section area in this case is my trapezium. Okay, so now we must first focus on finding the area of my trapezium. Okay, because we know that volume is given to be cross section area times height. So my volume is 2240. How to find area of trapezium? Half. Very good. So in this case, my parallel lines are number one and number two. So the one at the bottom is 12. The one at the top is 16. So it will be 16 plus 12. Followed by my perpendicular height, which in this case is x. This is for my area. Then I must multiply by my height. The height, uh, I'm not talking about this height over here. I am talking about this over here. So it's like this is my prism, this is my cross section area. My height is this portion over here. Okay, so from here, you will multiply by 20. Okay, so from here, you simplify the entire equation, you will get 280x. So 280x is equal to 224, means x is equal to 8cm, shown. Okay, next, they ask you to calculate the cost of painting the solid if the paint costs $3 per cm squared. So means you must find for me what is my total surface area. Okay, so in this prism, there's a total of six sides, okay? And for these six sides, my trapezium, there is one over here, there is also one at the back. So they are exactly the same, okay? For this rectangle at the side over here, you have one over here. You have also one at the back. So they are also exactly the same. The last two distinct areas that we must find is the area at the top and the area at the bottom. And they're all rectangles. The only thing is there's a trapezium over there, right? Which we have already found out to be this. 
So therefore, for my total surface area, okay, you have to find two trapeziums. This is only for one. So therefore, you will have two times half times 16 plus 12 times 8, since x is 8. Then afterwards, you have your rectangles at a side in yellow. There's also two of it. So for this particular rectangle, it's length times breadth. What's my length? What is my length of this rectangle? Anybody? 20. And then my height will be 2. Very good. Okay, which is this length over here. And then this is, I have already covered four surface area. I have two more to go. The rectangle at the top is just 20 times 16. The rectangle at the bottom is just 12 times 20. Finish. So from here, you evaluate this whole thing in the calculator. To give you 8, 6, 4. CM squared. So I must paint a total of 864 CM squared. If 1 CM squared costs $3, your total cost times 3. So 864 times 3. Okay, to give me 2592. Okay, so for those that tried, good job to you. You can give yourself a thing if you got it correct. Okay, for part C, yeah, I can tell you this. Part C is the challenging, the most challenging question you can ever face in this topic. If you understand this, you know how to do. You are good to go for your exam. Really. The solid is melted and made into cubes with surface area of twenty four cm squared. So this surface area, okay, first thing first, how many sides does a cube have? Six. Thank you. So that means if six sides is 24, you must first find for me what is one side. So one side will be 4 cm squared. Okay. So from there, you are then able to find for me what is the length of one side, which is to square. So when you square 4, you will just get 2 cm. So this is the length of the cube that I can form. Now you must find for me what is the volume of the cube that I can form. Right? Because if one side is 2, 2, 2, to find the volume is just 2 times 2 times 2. So give me 8 cm. Okay, so that's the first step. You calculate how much, um, what's the volume that you can form for my end product. Then now, take note, when you melt a solid, Okay, your volume doesn't change. So if initially my volume was 2240, I melt already, I do into another shape, it will also be 2240. So that means my total number of, my total volume that I can potentially form is 2240 over here. So if one solid, I mean one cube is 8 cm cube, to find the number of cubes, you take your total volume, which is 2240, divided by 8, very good, to give me 300 and 30. Okay, no, sorry, not 330, 280. Okay, 280. That's it. Okay. You all finished the paper at the back? Okay, very good. So far, everything correct? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, moving on to the next question. Okay, next question, percentage. And I always talk about this today. Okay, I think five times really. Original number is always? How many percent? Thank you. So when you increase by 40%, you will reach a percentage of 140%. So 140% is your 119. So you are looking for a hundred percent of my number. So therefore, hundred over one one four times, and sorry, one one four zero times one one nine to give me eighty five. Finish. That's it. Okay.
Okay, for part B, the fishmonger bought 300 fish for 1,500. So that means you can calculate the cost of one fish. Okay, he discovered that some of the fish were spoiled and cannot be sold. The fishmonger sold the remaining fish at $7 each and made a profit of $334. Calculate the percentage of fish that were spoiled. Okay, so from here, the first thing you must find when it comes to profit, you must realize that it is the amount of money you earn after you take into account the money you spend. So first thing first, if you pay 1,500 for three fish, the cost of one fish is given to be 1,500 divided by 300. To give me $5. Okay. Then afterwards, the question here said, you, some of the fish were spoiled and cannot be sold. When I say some of the fish cannot, cannot be sold, means you spend the money, but you don't use it. That's a waste. You made a total profit of how much? $334. How much do you spend at first? 1,500. So means you collected a total of, very good. Okay, 1,500 plus 334 to give me 184. I collected this amount of money. What do you say? Yes, okay. Then since you sold them at what? $7 each. That means the total number of fishes sold Thank you. 1834 divided by 7 to be equal to 262. Okay. Then from here, calculate the percentage of fish that was spoiled. So in this case, remember I talked about percentage, right? They always get up to 100%. If you are not spoiled, it means you are spoiled. Right? That's the two opposite, right? You're either spoiled or not spoiled. So if you want to calculate the percentage that was spoiled, in this case, if you can sell 262, means 262 is not spoiled. You give me the percentage of fish that is not spoiled. Can you find for me percentage that is spoiled? You can. Okay, so let's just do that. So percentage of fishes that were spoiled. You start with 100%. You minus away the percentage that is not spoiled. Which in this case is what? 262 over 300 times 100%. Okay, so this will give me a final answer of 12 whole, two third percent. Okay, so technically this, this line is not needed, right? Okay. Okay, moving on. To part C. Okay, for part C, a vintage bag is priced at USD 2300 in, in Los Angeles. And calculate how much a person needs to pay in SGD if the exchange rate is 1 SGD to 0 0.741 USD. Okay, so from here, what you need to take care of is number one, SGD 1 is equal to USD 0 0.741. So now you are spending a total of USD 2300. So the question is, how much SGD am I using? Right? So from here, you can do this answer, you can do this question in one line. How to find the SGD you paid? Anybody can tell me how do I find the amount of money you paid? Divide by Thank you. Times one, right? So times one you do anything. You know why right? the value doesn't change. So two three zero zero divided by zero point seven one. Final answer one of the nearest dollar. So what you will see in the calculator is this, right? But if you want one of the nearest dollar, it will be three one zero four.
Okay, yeah, but must be careful. Uh, over here, I didn't put down the times one because my value doesn't change. In the event this is two dollars, you must multiply by two. Okay, but there will be very rare times they give you two dollars. It's always one dollar is to a certain weight. Okay, so that's it for percentage and your weight question. I don't think this is a very big issue for those who tried. I hope it's not. Okay. Can I move on to, okay. Moving on to the next question, your angles question. Okay, so over here, part A asks you to find the values of X, Y, and Z in the diagram below. So first thing first, you see parallel lines. The thing about parallel lines is that when you see parallel lines, there are a few things we can use. There are three particular properties that we can use. Okay, so let me put over here at the side. Uh. Okay, first one, your alternate angles. Alternate angles is when what? You see a Z. And of course, these two lengths are parallel to each other. So the angles inside are equal to each other. This is the first one, alternate angles. Second one is your corresponding angles. For this one line, your parallel lines are over here. They lie on the same line. So for this, you have two criteria. Your angles must, number one, lie on the same line. Number two, they must lie on your parallel lines. So what's the difference between corresponding and interior angles? That's what most students are confused about, right? Corresponding angles are when the angles face the same direction. So over here, you can see both angles are facing downwards. If they are facing the same direction, means the angles are also the same. So this is for corresponding angles. So same direction. Same angle. Then what if they face opposite direction? Like for example, over here you see, the red color angle face downwards, the blue color angle face upwards. If they are facing opposite direction, this is what we call interior angles. Opposite directions means add up to 180 degrees. Okay, so take note of this. Very easy to remember, same direction, they are the same. If they face opposite direction, it means they add up to 180 degrees. You need to know this and the reasoning during the exams. Okay. Now you want to find what's the value of x, y, and z. First thing first, we look at the equation and see what we can work with. You have parallel lines, right? If this is 130 and it's facing this direction. This angle lies on the same line and lies on the parallel lines. Are they facing in the same direction? Same direction means the angles are corresponding, means they're equal. So this is 130. So first thing first, you must write down. Angle LMS is equal to 130 degrees because of corresponding angles. Okay, don't even need to spell it out. Right? Just like write down in shortcut. Okay, corresponding angles. Then afterwards, to find angle Y, it will be 180 minus 130 to give me 50 degrees because it's a straight line. So what's the reasoning for this? Adjacent angles on straight line. Okay, so there's one unknown found. Then of course, when you see parallel lines, like I said, the three different properties, right? Do you see a, do you see a Z over here? Do you see a Z over here in red? Yes, right? So what does that mean? It means the angle X is equal to angle Y. So if angle Y is 50 degrees, X must also be 50 degrees because of Alternate angles. Okay. Last but not least, you want to find what is Z. Okay, so for Z, that's the interesting thing. You have a triangle. You have a line like this. 
You know this is 24, you know this is 50, you must find what it is. Yes, and what is that called? No, okay, but good try. Okay, what you need to understand here is, right, in a triangle, my sum of triangles is what? 180 degrees. So let's call this blue angle, the blue angle. Okay, no, maybe I'll call it X now, okay? X plus 50, okay, I cannot call it X because I have X with it. Let me call this A. Okay, so let's say A plus 24 plus 50, is equals to 180 because of angle sum of triangle. Second thing where we can use A is what? This is a straight line. On a straight line, my angles also add up to 180. So A, okay, let's say this, the blue one is A, the green one is B. Yeah? A plus B is also equals to 180 degrees. You look at these two equations, can you see that the A is common, so you can ignore? So essentially, what does that mean? 24 plus 50 must be equal to angle B. So this reasoning behind this is called exterior angles of a triangle, not angles on a straight line. Okay, exterior angles on a, on, on, in a, on a, exterior angles of a triangle. Huh? So therefore, Z is just equals to 24 plus 50 to give me 74 degrees, exterior angles of the triangle. Your criteria here very simple. You must have a triangle and you must have a straight line. That's all. But must you really do this? Don't need. You can always go and find for me what's the blue angle, then find for me what is the green angle. But you'll realize the numbers are the same. But it doesn't harm to write extra line, okay? Okay, moving on, right, part B, you have a regular n-sided polygon with exterior angle x. What we know about polygons is that the sum of exterior angles is equal to, anybody? Sum of exterior angles is equal to, I will ask somebody to say something, 360. Okay, so my sum of exterior angles will always be equal to, 360 and this is a regular polygon with n number of sides. So therefore, my number of sides multiplied by my exterior angle will give me 360. You want to find what is n? It will be simply 360 divided by one exterior angle, which is x. Finish. Part 2. They told you that the size of my interior angle is three times the size of my exterior angle. So interior angle is 3x, my exterior angle is x. Interior angle plus exterior angle equals to 360, correct or wrong? Correct or wrong? Wrong. Why wrong? 180. It must be equals to 180. This portion, please be very careful. Okay, so having said that, that means that 3x plus x is equals to 180. 4x is equals to 180. Therefore, x must be equals to 45. Okay, so from here, that's it. Because x to your angle is x, so it's just 45 degrees. Okay, so now hence find the value of n. From part one, we already told me that n is equal to 360 over x. So now if x is equal to 45, it's 360 over 45. You give me. Because of the word n, if you don't use part one and part two, you will not get the mark, even if your answer is correct. Okay, moving on to the very last question of the mock paper. Okay, seems like we'll end early today. 
Can I move on? Okay, over here you have this table with some values and I have the frequency, right? So in case you don't know or you haven't learned, okay, which I'm assuming most of you haven't learned, this inequality sign over here tells me that my timing here is between 12 and 12.5 inclusive. Inclusive means it also means 12.5 is in this range. Okay, so this is under the topic of stats, which is the last chapter for some of you. Okay, so frequency means the number of times the value appears. In this question, you interview a total of 80 university students, which means in total, I must collect 80 different timings. So my frequency here must add up to 80. So therefore, if you want to find the value of k, k, it will be simply 80 minus 21 minus 18 minus 14 minus 12. Yeah, that is for k. Inclusive. The word is inclusive. Sorry, I know my handwriting is quite bad. So if you got any question, you just ask me. Okay. Okay. So that's the value of k. Huh? So now I know this 15. Now the next portion asks you to find the number of students who took at most 13.2 seconds to complete a 100 meter speed. The word at most 13.2 seconds means you must be 13.2 and below. So 13.2 is the slowest and it includes 13.2 as well. So therefore, it will be from here, here, and here. Right? Because everything else before that, you are slower than you are faster than 13.2. That's why you take lesser time. So therefore, it will be 21 plus 18, plus 15. That's for 21, plus 18, plus 15. You give me? Okay. Last question is on pie chart. So just to do a simple recap on pie chart, your pie chart over here has a few different sectors. Okay, from here, so let's say it's 90 degrees. This is 120 degrees. So if this is 90, this is 120, the last angle must be 150. How do you get 150? Very good, 360 minus the two angles. So this will be 150. So first thing for pie chart, angles add up to 360. This will never change. Second thing, the bigger the angle represents more data, so more people. Okay, so the bigger the angle, the more data you have. The smaller the angle, the lesser data you have. That's the second thing. Third thing, okay, 360 degrees is the entire pie chart, and this 360 degrees represents everyone so everybody in this test or in this sense so you can also call it a total okay so total number of people is always represented by 360 degrees so in this question i have a total of 80 students so 80 students is represented by 360 degrees <clears throat> For the sector that represents students who took more than 13.2, but at most 13.6. At most 13.6 means what? Highest or rather slowest is 13.6. Then the rest is more than 13.2. So it's 13.3, 13.4, 13.5, 13.6. The criteria that it falls under is over here. So that's 14 people. 14 people fall under this particular category over here. So what I must find now is what is the angle that is covering 14 students. Okay. So what will you do, this, what will you do to solve this in the past? You'll find what's one student, 
then multiply by 14. But what, like what I said at the beginning, uh, you write down what you want over what you have times 360 degrees. And this will give you 63 degrees. Okay, so take note, uh, the more data you have, the bigger your angle. So if 14 is 63 degrees, something like 12 cannot be bigger than 63 degrees. I want you to be very careful. Okay. So we are technically ahead by 20 minutes. So let me just go through one more question from your notes. So can you all go back to your notes on page number four, your practice on your own question. Okay. We look at question number six. Okay, question number six. You bought a TV for 2,800 before GST. They were charged 9% GST. Paid a 10% down payment and the remaining amount in monthly installments over a period of five years. So first thing first, you must calculate for me what is my total amount of money that I'm paying, right? 2,800 is before GST. So how many percent is 2,800? 100%, very good. So therefore, if you want to calculate after GST, is 109%. So 109 over 100 times 2,800. Okay, this will be 3052. So that is the amount of money you are actually paying for the TV. Okay. <clears throat> and according to the question, they pay a down payment of 10%. So what does that mean? This 3052, okay, you split into 10% and the remaining 90% because my original is always 100%. Okay, because your final price you're paying is 3052, so that's 100%. You pay 10% first, right? So you pay 10% first. Down payment means you pay first. Okay, so this is my down payment. Your 90% is spread across your installments for five years. But you pay monthly, right? So how many months is that in total? Huh? 60. How do you get 60? Five times. Five times 12. Okay, you give me 60 months. So you're paying across 60 months. So if you want to find out how much amount of money you are paying every month, you must find out for me what is my total amount of money that I haven't paid yet, which is 90%. So therefore, you find for me what is 90%. 90 over 100 times 3052, which amounts to 2746.80. And you are paying this across 60 months, so one month, 60 months ah. so one month you must divide by 60 okay which is 45 dollars and 28 cents okay so this portion why i go through because there's a down payment portion that you must take note of and yes your question did i calculate anything only Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, but the answer is correct. I just write wrongly. Okay. Okay. So that will be all for today's session. But before you go, I need to help me do something. Okay. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's something in exchange for you. Lah, okay. Can I? You're done copying it. Before that, lah, sorry. You got any more questions or not for today? Confirm to have, ah. Okay. I need your to do this feedback form. You show me that you are done, you'll get a free full scat pad. Okay. Full scat pad over here. Okay, so same for those online, but.
Nope, only one. And if you need to fill up the teacher's name, then my name is Mr. Clarence, uh, C-L-A-R-E-N-C-E, -E, okay? Just in case you need to write the teacher's name. Then once you're done, show me the, the submission and you can get your class. To help everybody prepare for the end of year exams, it's just a four weeks lesson until end of year exams. So if you're interested, you can go and look at the schedule over here or on our, on, or on our website. It is offered at all our locations. Uh, but I'm at Coven, okay? So for my lesson, is from Saturday 10 to 12. And it's only a four weeks thing for this booster program. So if you're interested, you can always scan the QR code to check, okay?